Hello everyone, welcome, welcome. Today uh, we have a very busy uh, schedule because we have a fantastic guest. But just before I introduce our guest, I will introduce my my beloved friend and co-host, Dr. Dr. Benjamin Del Sol. Benjamin is quantum physicist, uh, European patent attorney, deep tech innovation strategist, and many other stuff also such as artificial intelligence entrepreneurs uh, um, neuro 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 um, coaching expert also uh, hello Benjamin how are you fine fine and great I mean being here today will be is awesome we will have a wonderful episode and it will be it will be yeah great for sure so thank Would you, you like very, to add thank you very much for the invitation Oh, it's, it's always a pleasure and uh, because having your expert view is always very precious for me. And um, would you like to add some, maybe some precision about my uh, presentation? Oh, no, no, you, no, your introduction is good. I mean, uh, I just can add that I'm an outsource IP manager and IP strategist for several companies. Um, and that's it. I mean, I mean, the introduction is just to say that I use IP to, to help companies to make sustainable competitive advantage. Fantastic. That's Fantastic. So let's bring on board uh, our guest. Yep. Welcome, uh, dear Dr. Fred Jordan. It's a real pleasure to have you today with us. How are you? Fine, and yourself? P perfect. Thanks for, for being our guest today. And um, and uh, we are very glad to have you uh, because uh, you, ha you have lunched with your, with your uh, co-founder, a fantastic uh, tech startup uh, 23 years ago that now... Uh, help uh, billions product to be safe on the market. Um, so thanks again for accepting to, to have uh, this moment with us. You're welcome. It's a, it's a pleasure to, to be there with you. Uh, and um, I'm sure it's going to be uh, very interesting. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, before we deep dive into AltVision, your, your company, uh, let's talk about a little bit about yourself and your, 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 early, your early time uh, uh, when, you, when you were a student and how you, you, you moved from, from being a tech student into uh, research and then from research into deep, deep tech entrepreneurship because it's not very uh, usual, particularly 20, 23 years ago. So, and then we will deep dive into, into app vision more, more precisely. So could you maybe uh, talk about a little bit your, your, your parcours, your journey? Uh, where, where are you from? Uh, because we are talking in English, but you are, you are French. <laughs> uh, where did you do your, your studies and how did you evolve during, uh, during uh, this, this era? Well, uh, yes, indeed, I'm a French uh, physicist. So I studied uh, in an engineering school in France mm -hmm. called uh, INSA. And I did that because I wanted to learn about quantum mechanics. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, after that, uh, um, I had, by some circumstances, uh, the opportunity to make a PhD in Switzerland at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in the signal processing lab of Professor Kunt. Um, and then uh, I, I met uh, Martin Kuter, uh, with whom we worked on technologies called digital watermarking. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it started from there, actually. <laughs> we will talk about this more precisely. Um, just uh, about your PhD research, you, you took with yourself the, the, your, your, your PhD subject, right, into the, into the startup, right? It's, it's, yes. OK, so we will we'll talk about this uh, a little bit later. Concerning your, your early stage as an as a engineer uh, student at in, INSA, right? Uh, you said that you wanted, uh, you were interested by, by quantum physics, but you know, uh, particularly at that, at that time, uh, now it has changed, but at that time, uh, quantum physics was um, under, you know, the, 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 the specialty of the, the university, not engineering school. Uh, was it a was it a mistake of of, uh, of orientation or what? Because uh, usually, let's say uh, people who wanted to study astrophysics or, or quantum physics uh, moved into university, and those who want to be very hardcore engineering uh, way, you know, they, they they of course they they follow engineering the way of the engineering school. So, how did you end up into engineering school? Well, um, it, it, it's uh, it was a very 
specific engineering school where um, there was uh, the training was on microelectronics and which is engineering indeed but in order to fundamentally understand microelectronics you have to master quant uh, quantum physics so quantum mechanics uh, this is why it went this way and uh, this is why i selected this school uh, mm. because I, I thought it was absolutely wonderful uh, the complexity and mastering this was for me uh, I had to do this. So I studied this as an amateur <laughs> for several years before I had the chance to, to learn it uh, from professors. Mm. So, um, and, and work also on, uh, on uh, superconductors, uh, super, uh, uh, high temperature uh, superconductors. Um, and made a number of publications uh, at that time in this field uh, because uh, I was really passionate about this. The problem of physics is uh, at that time, as you're right, it was hard to find a job. Um, and there was something else um, that I studied also a lot at that time uh, uh, as an amateur also, uh, was uh, artificial neural networks. So mm. these are, I mean, at the end of the day, it was a lot about mathematics and our vision, I think fundamentally is a lot about mathematics also. Mm. But you could have ended to study uh, or to, uh, and even doing research in, in, in uh, theoretical physics, you know, uh, um, but why, why, why would you were interested to, to, to you know, by this type of, of um, education that, that makes it of practical and experimental and also theoretical yeah. Uh, path? Yeah, do you know, in, in France, um, to be very schematic, okay, in France, um, the hierarchy is engineering school on the top and mm. university below. Yeah. It's like this, okay. Uh, this is why... For me, going to university was not was a no-go. Okay. Mm. If I wanted to, to have a professional future, I should not go to university. I had to go engineering school. It, it's, it's the way it is. Mm. And in France, it's even worse than this because in engineering school, there are different categories. Yeah. Uh, but since I'm, I'm not a very smart guy, <laughs> I, I had actually one of the lowest category of engineering school, but at least it was engineering school. And, mm. but, and that's right, that I think uh, at the art, I'm also an engineer. I, I love to do things, to make things work. Mm. So, um, so that's part of, of, of the things I love. Let's remind that uh, the injury, engineering um, training is also supposed to, to teach uh, people to, to solve problem, to solve technical problem and bring technical solution. Why um, university teaching, of course, things have changed since since that era, but uh, was more on the basic side on the, on the science, you know, very uh, finding the truth, from, uh, discovering new things, but not necessarily uh, finding solution to problems. But in very engineer are are made to to solve so to find solution to problems. Yes, I think it's it's very important here uh, to see that. I think there are two categories of, of people uh, if we consider scientists uh, that people who love to understand all the details of things and do their research on this. And there are some other people who love to make things work. Mm. And whether they understand or not is a secondary priority, okay? And I'm more on the second category. I want to make things work. And if I don't understand the, everything, it's okay as long as it works. And, and for this, um, companies like Alvision is exactly a perfect example. I, I can give uh, several examples where we didn't master everything, but it was still working and it was still selling. So fantastic! So you 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 ended into 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 this engineering school. So it was perfect for, for your mindset, and and you could have uh, just. Uh, try to find uh, an engineer job just after your graduation and doing what you were trained for. But why did you what did you knock out the door of a of a basic science lab to 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 enter a PhD program? Because when when we enter into a PhD program, it's uh, it's um, program us to to become an academic uh, and, and researcher a uh, scholar. So w w why did you uh, come uh, moved into into the into the research? Uh, I think it's a, it's a quite, um, I mean, fundamental research, uh, I thought was, you know, really, when you go into fundamental research, you are going to become one of the, the best experts in the world, okay, that mm -hmm. has never been uh, in a very specific topic, okay. So, 
of being one of the best experts uh, was something uh, I loved this idea. Mm. Okay. Uh, and I must say also that was interesting is that my wife, uh, uh, with whom I, I made actually the engineering in school, was exactly the same uh, setup, uh, brain setup, I would say. So, so we made the engineering school together, and we both wanted to make fundamental research also together, and we made a PhD together actually at the EPFL. So there was like it was a logical thing to do to to yeah to 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 go in the roots of things. Not mm -hmm. a superficial way. Go inside and understand what people have done before, and then I regretted it at some time, uh, at some point when writing the PhD because there was uh, so many readings. I <laughs> 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 but uh, that was the motivation behind. And how did you find your 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 laboratory to, to follow the PhD? Uh, uh, because once again, twenty twenty three years ago. Um, it was more difficult, you know, to, to identify the right labs and the right professor. Uh, now everything is on, on the internet, you know, we can find, you know, uh, the topics you like and knock at the door of, uh, of people with an email. But how did you find your labs? <laughs> I was hoping you would not ask a question, <laughs> but <laughs> no, no, the, the, I will bring my wife again on board uh, because uh, in, in this engineering school, I was one of the worst uh, students, you know, there, there are some uh, some rankings, and I was uh, at the bottom of the ranks. Uh, but she was on the top. And because she was on the top, she was directly invited by the EPFL to make a PhD. Oh. Okay. Uh, and she said to the professor, uh, I'm happy to make a PhD, but you have to take my husband. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> so, so it's not very glorious, but it went this way. <laughs> History repeats itself, you know, we have this exact story with Jacques Chirac and Bernadette Chirac, Jacques Chirac, the president of France, who were a very bad student at, at ENA, at, uh, you know, the, the, and it's Bernadette who was always top of the ranking. She, she always uh, bring Jacques uh, uh, with her everywhere, uh, you know, <laughs> so. That's incredible. I didn't know about this story. So uh, you enter into this, um, PhD program, you, you do basic research, and what was your topic? Because um, it's important because what you discovered during this PhD is uh, what nurtured your, your uh, entrepreneurial adventure then. Yes, so we, we had different topics in, in this lab, but one of the topics which was uh, of great interest at this time was called uh, digital watermarking. Mm -hmm. And the idea was a, a very simple idea uh, that comes from steganography, which is most more ancient technology, which is you take a digital image and you modify the pixels very slightly <laughs> so that you don't see any difference, but you have been able to hide a message into the picture. Mm. And this message can only be decoded with a computer software. So you have hidden a secret message that will always move with the picture. Even if you change the file format, even if you take a picture of the uh, picture displayed on the screen, or even if you print it, there is still this information embedded within the slightly color change. Wow. And the same for video we made also. Wow, wow, wow. Those, that, that was the, the what, on you, what, what you work it on, right? Yeah. OK. And uh, can we say that that, that was the, the element of uh, the intellectual property that will uh, follow you into your startup, or exactly, okay. absolutely, okay, okay. So now uh, you graduate, you, you defended your PhD, and what happened in your mind to with your co-founder that was in the same lab than you, right? Yes. Um, so what happened first is that there was a company that hired us, um, mm -hmm. and uh, my friend Martin Kutter and, and myself. And the idea this time was to use digital watermark technologies for photographs. You know, the, the idea was to hide the name of people taking picture into the picture so mm. that they could claim their copyright in case of reuse. And we were hired uh, by this company and uh, the company promised us some shares, okay? Because we, we bought uh, the technology. But after two years, uh, we uh, realized there was no signed contract, nothing actually. Uh, 
sorry, we were young and stupid. And <laughs> <laughs> at the end, we had no shares at all. Okay, so he basically took the technology but didn't give the shares. Mm. Uh, so then my friend said, uh, Fred, we have to quit. Uh, so I said, yes. Um, <laughs> And uh, we decided to create our own company using uh, our technology. Um, how did you uh, decide to, 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 to quit the academic career and to, to become an entrepreneur or even to join the, at first uh, a company? Because you could have uh, continued the research postdoc and become maybe becoming professor. And What happened? Yeah, so, so that, it, it was very... So, uh, we're talking about um, 19, uh, 1999 or 2000, okay? Uh, in our lab, the lab of Professor Kunt at the EPFL, uh, this professor was really for startups. Mm. So he was encouraging actually his PhD to leave university and create companies. Okay. And, and, he's, and actually, this was the guy who said, you too, <laughs> uh, you will create a company at, at some point in the future. So this is why we, we started to, to work together. And, uh, and uh, yes, he's sweet German, I'm, I'm French, and that was quite a good match. And still after 25 <laughs> years or 30 years, still a good match. So. Fantastic. So, th so that professor put the seed of entrepreneurship into your mind, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, wow. exactly. Yeah. Fantastic. And just let let remind that at that time, uh, you didn't have the ecosystem of startup uh, at EPFL. Now we have it. Uh, we have a startup and creator, you have technology transfer office, you have uh, business angels, uh, venture capitalists, every, everything working, you know, big company that are plugged into this ecosystem. But at that time, you didn't have anything. So you didn't, you, you didn't have any support from the, from the, uh, the, your, your institution to support your, your startup uh, creation. Yes, absolutely. We, we had to discover, um, many things even the most basic things mm -hmm. uh, from scratch uh, wow. <laughs> so now let's talk about the from scratch moment because this is a fascinating and a lot of uh, teaching uh, for many deep tech entrepreneurs because when you and created at vision uh, so you had to incorporate it you know to hire a lawyer i i, I guess and doing all of this maybe evidence uh stuff but i want to know everything you know so, uh... so first we had um one chance is that there was a guy uh, who was way way more older than the other phd who was working for uh, the equivalent uh, inner swiss project in our lab and he has founded his own company and i was hearing about what he was saying because he was working with one of uh, uh one colleague and um this guy, we actually contacted him. We said, uh, can you help us uh, to, uh, to, to make some business? What is business? <laughs> what is a company? <laughs> so he was much older and experimented than us. He was an engineer from the EPFL. Mm -hmm. So he had also the same culture. And basically, it was a bit, uh, yeah, he helped us to, uh, uh, to, to create the company itself and uh, the basics about uh, making an offering. Uh, or discussing with with prospects and things like this. So, uh, the, I mean, the fact that it was, that we had this mentor, and we finally integrated him into the company. So, when we created um, the company, uh, we had some shares between him uh, and us. So we we split uh, a bit uh, between us. So he was a kind of mentor for for helping you. Uh... Uh, it's the story of every every PhD student. We always uh, you know, learn from older PhD and postdocs uh, for to do the stuff. In a, even in entrepreneurship, it's always the same. We always learn from uh, people who are more experienced uh, than us. Yes, uh, the fact is that th there is something that we really uh, wanted to learn mm -hmm. and recognized that we had to learn. <laughs> Too obvious, but necessary conditions, okay? And then, the, and he was happy to give his knowledge, as I'm happy today to help startups, by the mm. way. And I do this for free. I mean, mm. I'm just, it's just a pleasure to, to transmit. This is actually what I'm doing right now. Mm -hmm. I hope that this will inspire some startups. So I try to, to do the same. Okay. So, and 
And that's always a perfect match, actually. Everybody's happy in this kind of deal. Mm -hmm. uh, now he's, he's retired, but he's still a good friend. And uh, actually, he left the company uh, rich. So. And I guess that the first uh, thing that he could have told you at that moment that a company is uh, to, to bring value to make money, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not, well, not, money. not doing re basic research because most of the PhD who, who launch startup want to continue their basic research, but out of the academic world. But that, it is not. This is not making a company. A company is bringing value, something that is useful, and making money from it. Yes, these are the kind of obvious things that we had to um, uh, to internalize. Mm. <laughs> if you want. Because, um, uh, yeah, it, it was, uh, you know, th there was a transition at some point because what, what we had basically, I tell you, uh, practically, was we had a common line that was able, you, you, you gave uh, as input a picture and it was a, a message mm -hmm. and then you launched the common line and the output was another image uh, that had some embedded information. And that's it. This is all what we had. Okay. And you are not going to sell a common line system uh, like that does this. It doesn't work this way. And uh, this we discovered. <laughs> so, so uh, okay, you, you launched a company, but at, at that time, once again, uh, you don't have any client, you, you don't have any money, you don't have investors. So how uh, did you survive? How did you, um, you have the same technology and how did you find the right application uh, that will uh, lock you into into the counterfeiting market for decades, and uh, how did you make money from it? Yes, so indeed, when we started, we had twenty thousand Swiss francs. Uh, mm. This was the capital of the of the company uh, that we had to bought. So altogether, so I don't know, maybe I put uh, twelve thousand into this. Mm. Okay, and. Um, and basically, I was it's, alone. It's, uh, it's a big my, number uh, for for freshly graduated PhD student, but it's not a lot, you know. Uh, you have to pay yourself. You have to to pay the bill of the of the electricity of, of the rent of where you live. So you have to find rapidly. Uh, how 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 long did it, it, it took you to to find a, uh, some good good market? Well, actually. Um, it took a bit some time. What happened is that uh, with this, I was able uh, to, to leave for a few months. Mm. Then I had the unemployment. Okay, so I was supposed to look for a job. Mm. <laughs> and in return, <laughs> I had the, so that, that helped. Okay. And I, at first, by the way, I thought that I would have a lot of offerings mm. and I, I would have to refuse them. And what happened in reality is that uh, I had no offerings at all. Nobody mm. wanted to hire me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was anyway locked into uh, uh, succeeding. But then, so there is a, um, a number of uh, luck events okay, mm -hmm. uh, that happened. First thing about finding the right product was uh, we imagined what could be the applications of, of our technology. And so how we could make money out. So one application was, of course, uh, user interface, so we had to learn about user interface. You give an image, it outputs a new image, and then it's protected. Wonderful. So we tried to uh, sell this to photographs, and we made 400 Swiss francs. <laughs> wow. The total amount that we ever made with this. Champagne. <laughs> <laughs> OK, but uh, we, we, what, what we decided to do is to make many uh, demonstration systems uh, in parallel. Mm -hmm. So uh, we made, for instance, for banknotes, uh, we made for banks, uh, we made for uh, CD-ROMs. Uh, so, and also we made a very important variation of this technology. Uh, so then it gets technical because from the beginning, we were talking about digital image and changing digital image. And at some point we realized that um, we could use the same algorithm to print yellow dots on a white paper, you wouldn't see the yellow dots. But by scanning with the document scanner and using our algorithms, we could retrieve the information. Mm -hmm. So then there was all a bunch of all other applications that came with this. So each time it was the same. A small uh, demonstration system with user interface, a PDF brochure of one page that explains the things like it's a standard product, you know, and then uh, we, <laughs> we discovered also that if you create a website and you wait, nobody's going to call. Okay. We, we did not know that, okay? So, 
<laughs> so we discovered that we have to call people. Then we started to call people. And for each category, we tried trying to sell what we thought was the, was the best product. Where at the end, we had 10 products in parallel. These were not products. We were like demonstration with the PDF. That's it. Mm. But one of the products uh, was based on this ability to print yellow dots. So I was printing this on my uh, HP, you know, uh, little uh, inkjet printer uh, mm. in my house. Okay? So on A4 pieces of, of paper. But one of these applications, um, a, a brand uh, told us that there weren't, well, the first thing before the brand, uh, it was a bank, okay? And now I can say it, it was the Zurich uh, Cantonal Bank, actually. Uh, we said, but it's very interesting, actually. You can hide some information um, without a special ink that we can decode with a normal scanner. And they had an application for this. And, and the application was, um, this was used for invoices, which are put in a, post letters and some, uh, some receipts were modified. And we were able to encode some invisible information so that people could not modify the amount that was uh, printed on, on, the, on the envelope. Uh, and that was uh, the first revenue that we started to make. It, it was not enough to make a living, uh, far enough, uh, but maybe we sold this 6,000 Swiss francs, if I remember correctly. <clears throat> But it was the, the first, I would say, real sell. The first win. Yeah. Uh, what, what is uh, um, surprising is that there are two obvious markets that did not respond. The first one is the, is the, is the CD market that at that time was a huge, uh, was treated massively by counter factor. And the second one is, uh, as you said, uh, the banknote. Why these two markets didn't respond massively to, to you? Okay, <laughs> so uh, for the CD, I have to tell you exactly what we did, okay? What we, it was more for the army, okay? Mm -hmm. And what we did is that, you know, at this time, you could actually print on CD. Mm -hmm. So what we decided to do is that we were printing with the, on the CD, the small dots, yellow dots, and, then in, and these dots were encoding a key that was needed to uh, decrypt the information on the CD. Mm -hmm. Therefore, in order to read the CD, you had to put it on the document scanner and then the software would allow you to decode what was inside the CD. So it was really high security, uh, for instance, for, for the army. Uh, nobody was ever interested by this, uh, I mm -hmm. tell you. But uh, and for the banknotes, <laughs> so um, that, that's, <laughs> that's a very uh, different story. Uh, so this is, you know, when you, as soon as you talk, uh, talk about magnet is really highly confidential. Uh, so we had a very big success, a very big success in this, um, in, in this field also. Uh, mm. It took a number of years and you can find, so the only things that I'm allowed to tell is what is public information, okay, uh, even today. And what is public information is some patents that we filed with the European Central Banks on some technologies uh, in order to hide information in the Euro banknote. Mm. So uh, the Swiss uh, the Swiss uh, banknotes are the most safe uh, banknote in the world because uh, if I well understood they are the only one who use our technology. No 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 it it was uh, put in the in the euro not in the Swiss. Oh bank. in the euro wow oh, sorry yeah wow okay that's great uh, it's uh, I'm honored to have uh, the man who's, who who protect the euro banknote <laughs> wow well, yeah yeah but we we didn't make well we make a good amount of money for this, but compared to what we made later in brand protection, that was, uh, uh, we made way more. <laughs> so how did you find, uh, once again, because you try, you try, you try many other uh, market and, and application, and how do you find the right one with the right business model? Because there is also a fantastic story for that. Yes. So, uh, so that, yeah, you're right. There are two things, the market and the business model, very important. So just calling and calling people. At some point in time, we, uh, we called a, a very big company, which I cannot disclose because <laughs> still a customer. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> very, <laughs> a customer that loves us, uh, but very huge company. Um, and the, the people were interested by our capability to put this on a box. Okay. Mm. So that was a product this time, okay. carton. And uh, initially that's interesting. The, what we had in our mind was we are two people Basically, um, they are ne never going to work with us. We are too small. 
that are not, never going to take us seriously. And we, we were wrong. We were wrong to a point we cannot imagine. That took us very, very seriously. That took us, took us more seriously than, our, than us, actually. Mm. Because, because um, they wanted to, that we make this not on a small HP printer, okay, but on a rotogravure industrial printing machines that we knew nothing about, um, that we are not able to do the small dots that we needed. So we thought it was like, basically impossible. But they believed we could do it which is incredible because normally you try to convince the customer that you can do something but it's the, it was the other way around they believe that we could do it and um, still today i'm still fascinated by this uh, incredible <laughs> relationship with people that believe more in us than ourselves that's, that's an incredible story maybe uh they had a very you know um there is a, a way to qualify that you know maybe they had a very urgent problem yeah about counterfacting that was very top of mind and you know pressure press, putting pressure on them and that's why uh, you know the this is the ideal client but we, you can't you can you can't uh, how can i say you can't uh, um, find them before talking with them you know so yes i, I think one thing that uh, we, we had there are many lucks okay but i can tell you one big luck that we had is that when we thought about um well, by chance because we tried so many things <laughs> by chance if you try enough <laughs> one thing is going to work okay uh, it was the brand protection market because the brand protection the idea was how can i detect a counterfeit box from a genuine box mm -hmm. very simple question and at that time in the 2000s basically the solutions were uh, holograms mm -hmm. or uh, special inks like ultraviolet inks or inks that change colors and the problem is that this security feature needed actually some expertise. So you have, because of course there were also counterfeit of the security feature. So it was like a human being trying to see if this was a real mm. <laughs> security feature. So you just push the problem. And, and the, the idea that we had was to say, okay, we are going to remove the human being from the equation. And with our document scanner and our box, we are going to cook the box on the document scanner and so you cannot close the, but it's okay so we can make a picture of the the box and the software will analyze the picture and give you the answer and you as a human being you don't have to be an expert you just press a button and it gives an answer period mm. and that was that was a very big thing but we didn't realize at first how important it is was how useful it is there was one point and the second point which is also very important that we didn't realize also it took it actually it took us many years to understand why we were selling so well <laughs> so <laughs> which is incredible so, uh, uh, and the second thing it was invisible so uh, when this big brand owner came to us and he saw that we had something invisible okay and that you could detect with a machine that was already a, a, a win and then there was a third thing <laughs> i forgot the third thing the third thing uh, was an incredible requirement of the customer who said basically guys um i want it to be invisible i want it to be easily and reliably detectable but i want also that it doesn't change anything in my production I want to produce at the same speed because I'm doing billions, billions of these boxes. So you're not going to tune some things uh, in my printing machines. Never, ever. And um, this was an incredible constraint for us because we did not know anything about industrial printing. Not one thing, zero. Okay. Uh, I knew about my small HP printer, that's it. So we had to discover this industry and uh, the technicalities around this. And... Uh, it's, it took us really some time uh, to, to become really expert in this field. And at the end, this was the intersection of industrial printing and digital watermarking at the intersection here that was innovation. Mm. And how did you uh, learn about the industrial process of manufacturing? They invited you in, in, in the factory and yeah. you discussed with the, with the technician, with the engineer who, who, yeah. uh, who run the factory? Absolutely. Wow. They invited us to come and... Uh, and to, to tune our uh, systems. But I, I, I mean, if we get technical, the problem is that all our idea was small yellow dots, mm. period. This is all what we wanted to do. Uh, 
but um, if you print this in digital, you can print a dot of about 40 microns. Mm. 30, 40 microns, you will not see with your eyes. But with their machine, they were printing like 100 microns. They were way too big, okay? And the quality people were totally uh, psychopaths, you know? They were, <laughs> they were extremely hard on the visual quality of the, of the product. So when we showed their products with all <laughs> yellow dots everywhere visible, they basically killed us. The, the quality <laughs> control, which was not acceptable at all, zero. So, um, and this was really a question when we, it, it's not going to be acceptable, never, ever. And, and then we, we tried something else, we, which uh, is which very, very strange. Uh, all of these products had a layer of varnish. And then we discovered afterwards that actually all boxes have a layer of varnish. And we, we tested one thing. Instead of doing dots, we started to create holes in the varnish. And the big thing is that the varnish is done with plates, okay? And the plates are done with digital files. So all we had to do is to modify the digital file to put some holes, not dots this time, but thousands of holes everywhere. And when they printed it, well, the varnish looked perfect because we created some very small oscillations everywhere. But the quality guys, you know, they were tuned to see dots, because this is a typical defect of printing. But they were not tuned to see holes in the varnish. <laughs> <laughs> so the quality went perfect. Um, and then, well, the quality check was perfect. And surprisingly, very surprising, I tell you, is that um, by scanning this with a document scanner, we were able actually to detect, uh, to detect these, these very small variations of uh, uh, varnish thickness, but very reliably. Wow, and um, this this hole on the on the on the packaging, um, or do you, do you do you just detect? Hey, there is wall there is wall on this packaging and it's auto, it's genuine, or is also a, a pattern of uh, that make a glyph? You know, a kind of uh, crypto. Uh, is there any uh, uh, cryptography uh, linked to to this to, to the combination of of this wall and their place? Uh, so first, you know, at the beginning, we were so glad to be able to detect one pattern reliably. <laughs> so it was, but you're right. It didn't took very uh, long until the customer asked, oh, you know, I have different printing cylinders. And it would be nice, uh, Mr. Alvision, if you make a different pattern for each cylinder. And, uh, but surprisingly, this, this worked also very well because, you know, and then it goes to mathematics um, because at this point, the performance of detecting something that you cannot see is done with a technology or mathematic uh, things which is called image cross correlation okay and this is the, at the art of what we developed during the phd image cross correlation if you know what you're looking for and you put it in noise even very big noise you will very reliably be able to detect it mm -hmm. This is the power of cross correlation, and I tell you, all the money that we're making, basically, it's only based on one mathematical transfer. That's it. So. <laughs> uh, students in, in every uh, high school learn this this only this one theorem of mathematics. It's enough for you. <laughs> But, you know, it's the same for Google. Um, they, they invented a rapid uh, referencing system uh, in order to, to count the number of links. They used eigenvectors and eigenvalues to do this. This is pure mathematics mm. applied to counting the number of links. So there are many cases actually that, that I've seen also in the industry where you create a lot of value and a big barrier to entry because you don't rely simply on software. You rely on mathematics and there are less people <laughs> to <Yeah>. compete. <laughs> Absolutely. But th this is not the end of the story because uh, you could have sold the technology and bought some good champagne, and, and, but, but you have also combined this with a, with a great revenue model. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, sorry, I, I missed this point, but it's true. So um, I'm going again to talk about my wife. Sorry for this. But she was a vice president at uh, Nagra Vision uh, from the Kudelski Group. And um, she, she told me, you know, Fred, the, the business model that they were using uh, selling um, cards 
for conditional access for the TV. Okay. And the business model they had at Pudelski, they still have actually, was the rental of the car. So basically, this company was making money, not by working, they were not working, they were selling the card and then the right to use the card. And that was a wonderful business model. And then I realized later that the best way to make a lot of money is not to work for the money. If you have to work, basically, you're not in a good situation to, to make good money, okay? You should have recurring revenue that comes without work. On the top of this, you may work. Mm. <laughs> but it comes on the top of this. And you may actually get additional revenue for your work. And um, this was the business model of saying, okay, we are going to sell the right to print this pattern. Okay. Like um, 10 million of patterns, uh, you print it 10 millions and you give me 100,000 Swiss francs. Hmm. You do this one year and next year you have to pay again because you print again 10 million. And what is wonderful about this business model, obviously it has some value for the customer. Otherwise you would put a special ink or hologram that costs something, okay? So uh, that's wonderful. There is no cost of material. So for us, it's pure profit. Uh, but it's still a good deal. It's still a good deal. Everyone is winning in, in this situation. And if they, and if they stop uh, this line of product, they don't need to pay you the next year because they don't have this. Indeed. But what happened was the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> what happened is that they actually increased the number of protected products because they loved it. And then they put more and more products and we made more and more revenue. Actually, we, we, we find a wonderful case where uh, the, 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 the people realized that we were going to make so much revenue that they, tried, they renegotiated with us a maximum amount of revenue, like, uh, I know, over 1 million per year. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, otherwise it was uh, goes to the sailing. Wow, so this is really fantastic. So let's resume. So you find the, 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 the let's say, the, the Eureka application of your, of your technology that was uh, uh, putting authentication uh, wool on packaging of product, you mix it that with a fantastic revenue model based on on, uh, on royalty royalty based um, revenue model, and uh, this was a fantastic momentum because it it brings you a lot of money that allows you to to continue your research and development to because now you have evolved your technology you adapted to many others uh, industry and products so well. It was not that um, that fast, actually. Ah. Uh, the problem, <laughs> you know, uh, what I described, like uh, adapting to industrial printing system, it took us uh, several years, actually, and uh, because it was a bit complicated. And then we had another another look. We find a business angel okay, mm -hmm. uh, that said, uh, "I'm going to to invest in your company." And the deal was um, like. Uh, 600,000 uh, Swiss, Swiss francs uh, for something like 20% of, uh, of the company. And uh, that was wonderful because with 600, suddenly I could have this salary and, uh, <laughs> and uh, all of three, we could have a salary and, and work. Um, but even this was not really um, sufficient. It was really at the limit. In October 2003, we went to zero. Okay. Wow. We spent everything, okay? But <laughs> in October 2003, something else uh, happened is that we were increasing our revenue progressively and we were exactly break-even. <laughs> so we were <laughs> break-even at zero. <laughs> so at this point on, from October 2003, we never raised uh, any money again. We were only uh, organic growth uh, since... Uh, since uh, 21 years now. Wow, this is a fantastic uh, story because uh, so for for having such a successful company, people usually uh, raise several rounds. You know, like, you know the story in the in the in the startup in the startup scene. But you, you just raise one time external money, and then you you are still work, you're still living on your organic growth and uh, success. And wow, this is fantastic. And um, so uh, let's let's come back to 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 the to the to the team to the early team. You were three, right? You, uh, yes, you were yeah. yourself, Martin, and the and the third one, your yes, wife Roland. or someone else? Uh, Roland, yeah. Roland, okay. And uh, how many times did you did it, did you uh, it takes it took you to to hire people and to become bigger? And how many people you are now? So um, 
we hired employee number one uh, maybe in 2004. Um, and for, for us, it was an event, I, okay. I tell you, uh, because it was questions of charges, uh, how do, how, I mean, the first employee is really something big. Mm. You know, you are going to give uh, a work to someone and to bring uh, and to, to pay him uh, each month. Right? Mm. That, that may sound obvious, um, but for us, it was big. Uh, this, this moment was very big. Um, and uh, but nowadays we're about 20 uh, when one office in Shanghai and uh, one uh, in New York. So wow. uh, actually, <laughs> at some point uh, I had to leave my uh, my home. <laughs> so <laughs> and, you know, I was sitting in Vevey, So And when you say you have office in uh, New York and Shanghai, you mean uh, you have team there? Or, or... Yes, we, we have someone in, uh, in New York and someone mm -hmm. in Shanghai uh, and they take care of the commercial. Okay, okay. And um, where are your headquarters? You are in uh, Lausanne, no? Uh, no, we are in Vevey, uh, at okay. the border of the lake. And this is why the name Alp Vision, because from the border of the lake, <laughs> we see the Alps. So. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> Very obvious naming. So before we talk about uh, maybe uh, the new uh, development of the company, the new technology application, because you adapted your, your technology to new requirement of, uh, of the new, uh, let's say, industry. Um, how do you work internally? I mean, uh, do you 100% uh, you do your, your research and development internally or do you have partnership with, with, with uh, EPFL or other labs or um, how do you work? Okay, uh, so, so I, I'm going to make some statement here, sure. uh, which may be very wrong, okay? Um, uh, I, I basically, I, I quite don't like partnerships. Okay. Uh -huh. I would say to some extent, I hate partnerships. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, sometimes it's like uh, two losers that come together uh, to lose together. So uh, <laughs> I, I love when it's clear, uh, mm -hmm. who is the boss, who is the customer and who is the supplier. Okay. So I have suppliers and I have customers and it's clear who is paying who. Okay. There is no, nothing of, sharing uh yeah the only thing you share is product or service against money very clear so innovation in particular so uh, we are very you know not invented here people okay mm. so we are engineers the company is led by two phd imagine all the people inside uh, this, we are just geeks and technical people okay so we are very proud of ourselves we are never going to hire another company to innovate for us that would be shame <laughs> So, so never, never. So we always innovate. Uh, we innovate um, in a very, um, I would say, not structured way. Uh, it's mm. very unstructured. It's really um, opportunist, opportunistic. Each time we have a problem, uh, we sit together. Uh, we laugh a lot. Uh, this is a company when you spend half of the time laughing, actually. I believe, <laughs> and, uh, and and we we find some things, uh, and we patent a lot. And so. And uh, for seeking problems, <laughs> do you have to continuously uh, talk with uh, with uh, with your client or potential client and discover their problems? And uh, do you have this kind of behavior, you know, to continuously uh, uh, knocking at the door and say, "Hey, do you have problems <laughs> to share with us?" <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, you know, it was it it came very obviously. One of the big problems that we had after the vanish story, uh, there was uh, something else which I would call the smartphone story. Because remember, when we created the company, smartphones were not existing, okay? And finally, after several years, we were able to detect with a document scanner, which was giving a perfect picture, perfectly still, control lighting conditions, no motions, okay? And then it was working. And then pe some people, some customers came and said, hey, you know, Fred, it would be cool if I could detect this by taking a picture. So at, at the beginning, we are quite actually laughing, okay? Like, you know, we are detecting things which are 20 microns across, okay? And you want to detect it by a handheld device with, uh, with uh, random lighting conditions. You cannot be serious, okay? Mm -hmm. But of course it was serious. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, so then again, we laugh a, a bit and, and we worked uh, a bit also. And surprisingly, uh, we find some, some solutions. And I think um, th th there was two tricks to, to make this work. One trick was to forget about saying if it's a fake. 
We decided to say only when it's genuine. Okay, it may sound like a detail, it's very important. If you want to have a reliable detection, it's like a QR code. The QR code is not going to, to say, I'm not able to read it. It's not, it's not going to say anything. You, you have to wait until it, it succeeds. So we took this direction and we realized that, of course, most of the pictures are wrong. Okay, bad illumination, bad rotation, bad distance, bad everything, okay? But, but, <laughs> there is one solution, there was one solution, is to try enough. It's like the business model, right? if you try enough, okay? So <laughs> what we did is that we optimized the detection algorithm to work in real time. That means at 25 frames per second, we try to detect on each and every frame if we are able to detect, mm. okay? So the, basically the opposite of what we were doing with document scanner. So we have now a system that works. You take a product and you go with the smartphones, in two seconds it's done. And people say, that's wonderful, that's so reliable, but you're wrong actually. <laughs> you know, two seconds, that means that I failed 50 times. <laughs> you know, at 25 frames per second, it took me two seconds to detect. So uh, that, that's, that was a very big shift in our minds. Okay? Mm. And, uh, and actually it came to the point that nowadays, it detects better where people are not so so cautious, okay? Uh, because because they move, they actually multiply the opportunities of detection. Wow! <laughs> <laughs> you know, th there is a strategy that we call a lot uh, for innovation and for other things actually. Uh, at Alpegens, they judo. Okay, we are not. Uh, I'm not expert in judo, but something I remember is that in judo, um, you use the strength of your opponent. And we had many times, and this was an example, where you have a big problem and the idea is that you are not going on only to solve it, you're going to actually to, to become better because of this big problem. And that sounds like a theoretical thing, but in this example, it's a very practical thing because nowadays we don't know, sell any more any uh, document scanner detection, only smartphone detection. Hmm. And uh, the, the first smartphone that you, you used were... Uh the Apple and the Android uh, at that time, or, or, do you, or do you started with the, you know, with the Nokia, the, the old school Nokia, or, or you started with, with, the, with, the, with the real smartphone uh, era? Yeah, we, we started with some organizers that were able to take one picture at a time. <laughs> and, and this was a perfect failure because of what I said before. What we needed was a lot of pictures in real time in order to be successful. So all the times we tried it, uh, it was not working. When the iPhone 4GS came with its, its camera, for the first time, we were able to detect. This okay. is why today when customers tell me, Fred, um, do you need high-end uh, smartphones? Say, no, <laughs> iPhone was still working. So it was already <laughs> working, so, so it's okay. Um, now uh, you talk about Android. This is a totally different story because uh, for many years, we had only iPhone. And iPhone has a very specific thing uh, there is a library called VDSP, which is um, um, vector um, uh, signal processing, which is embedded uh, in uh, Xcode when you, when you program. That enables for us to have very fast processing. This is what we need for real-time detection. And the problem we have typically with old Androids is that they didn't have parallel processing or vector processing. And only after a number of years, the Android became uh, enough uh, powerful to handle uh, real time. And this is now we offer both Android and, and iPhone. And I tell you, Android is really not cool for a developer because you have so, so many models. We had a customer recently, we counted that we have more than 3000 different models uh, in, in, with the customers uh, using it. Wow. So, uh, okay, so you you have uh, you have your, your uh, research and development, inter you do your research and development internally, um, and you're always connected with the market and seeking uh, to solve the problem of the uh, uh, request by, by specific industry. You have many, many anecdotes also to tell us about, uh, I don't know, maybe the tobacco industry, uh, the, the perfume industry, the, the, the vine, also the vine industry, because the, you know, this, this, this industry are very treated by uh, by counterfacting and uh, how did you manage to adapt your technology for this the specific product and packaging and because it's, for example for pharmaceutical companies also a hell so 
Maybe you can tell us a little bit about, about this adaptation. Yes, you're right. Um, the first thing that we discovered is that there are different printing technologies. Uh, we didn't know about this, but this has a direct impact on what technologies we can use. So we had to learn about the specificities. Today, we have 250 printers worldwide printing our, oh. our solution, you know? So uh, we had to, to understand this. But there are things like, uh, you, you take a whiskey, for instance. Mm -hmm. We protect this. On whiskey, you have capsule in tin, and the same on wine, okay? Um, what people want is that we, they don't want that we protect the label, okay? Because people can reuse bottles. They mm -hmm. want to protect the capsule because the tin capsule is destroyed when you open it. And this is a big challenge because you have to print an invisible layer of varnish with holes on a curved surface and sometimes both curvatures and still able to detect this reliably with a smartphone handheld like this. So <laughs> this is very specific, and, but we, we did it and it, it, it works very fine. But um, when it becomes much, much worse is when our customer, and it was in 2007, came and said, uh, Fred, uh, we, 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 we would love to detect our products with a smartphone, wonderful. The problem is it is not printed. <laughs> and the only thing we knew <laughs> was printed, okay? That was, yeah. And at the same time, it, it, it was a, a flip off top of uh, injectable products. Mm. Mm, still a customer. So, <laughs> and, and the, the thing is that a flip off top, it is a, bit, uh, a small plastic part, which is molded and not printed. So forget about our invention, wonderful things, gone. And, and we tried to convince him to print something. And he said, <laughs> Fred, forget it. This is uh, medical uh, and medical, you are not going to print anything. It's regulated. Get out with this idea. I want to protect it without doing anything. So uh, that was, I mean, yeah. talk about judo. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and we found the solution. And uh, we still make a lot of, and more and more money on this. Uh, I tell you how it works, uh, very simple. Deceptively simple, actually. Uh, because we were obsessed about putting some small holes, actually creating a small defects everywhere with our printers. Okay. This is what we had in mind. This is, we were, you know, like this. We know, we need to know what we do, okay? And we, we had to switch our software and say, no, let, let's, let's relax a little bit. We see that this plastic part is matte. And it's matte for a good reason. It's matte because there is already a microstructure on it. We have not decided where is each uh, defects, but it's there. Okay. They are already there. It's already there. Okay, so judo again. So think about <laughs> it. Uh, let's relax. Let's take a picture of this part of plastic. And this is going to become our pattern. The, let, me, let me understand that. It's like there are already a fingerprint a wool and and, and 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 you know and high and low level of plastic already yeah. there and you just pick the picture and you you modelize that and you have the the fingerprint yeah. uh, okay very, very simple idea actually <laughs> uh, even simpler than the the initial uh, uh, pattern <laughs> very simple so so what we do is that uh, uh, what we discovered so we have to discover about molding we didn't know anything about molding <laughs> But the good thing about molding is that the microstructure that you get there, it's the same. It's the same. You, they produce like 100,000 products. It's going to be always the same. So what it means, you get it? I take one picture. I protect 100,000 products mm. with one picture. Wow. <laughs> I mean, and think about the marketing impact of this. You, you come to the front of the customer and normally I do this now. I take my smartphone, take the reference image and say, okay, it's already working. You just have to pay. I give you the app. Sorry, <laughs> it's done. It's it's wonderful. It's way more, way better actually than uh, than the crypto give the, the the pattern thing. So and um, so we started to do this for a first customer um, on the flip off. Uh, this was a very small deal, like uh, I think thirty five thousand Swiss francs uh, per year. And then it increased, 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 and we make more and more with it. And then uh, some other people came. Uh, more and more plastic parts. Uh, caps for the lubricant, uh, automotive lubricant industry, for instance, mm -hmm. we do a lot. And uh, one thing that we loved is that at some point in time, some people came with gold in goat. With what? Gold. Gold bar. Yeah, gold bar. Oh, okay. 
And this is the only customer I can give the name, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's Pump, P-A-M-P. Uh, this is, you know, the, the thing I didn't know about gold is that uh, Switzerland is one of the countries where there is the highest number of gold refineries. So we were, we did not understand that we are actually sitting on, on a gold market. <laughs> <laughs> and um, what is interesting about gold is that when you have a, even a small ingot, you don't have to think about 12 kilobars, uh, you have one gram bar. Yeah, yeah. And they are actually embossed with a tool. Mm -hmm. But when you emboss something, you emboss a face of someone. What do you do as a designer? You make the face matte in order to contrast with the background with this glossy, shiny. When you make something matte, you bet, you create a macrostructure. <laughs> so that means, again, you can use exactly the same technology. <laughs> we take one, uh, one gram, we take one reference image, and 10,000 bars are exactly the same, and we can authenticate all of them. Mm. without changing anything. Very important, you don't touch the product. So it's just a dream technology. So if you, if you go online, for instance, you go to the, uh, the App Store, there is the, the application is called Veriscan, Veriscan from Pump. You will see it's an app used by a uh, consumer. This is consumer market mm. and uh, people can uh, download it and use it for to authenticating gold bars without, uh, and it's, it's very hard to counterfeit this time, Nico, because it's really the microstructure uh, and this microstructure is created by sandblasting uh, the tool, so it's really hard. So <laughs> this is this is uh, fascinating, and uh, you already answer one of my following question. But uh, just before, no, just before I I, I re ask it uh, and have uh, uh, the answer. So you applied this this new methodology also to to mouse, right? Uh, for Logitech and other other, other manufacturers. Yeah, absolutely. You, you take your, the mouse that I have here, it's going to work perfectly on the buttons here. Actually, you know, the, the, we love a lot of, uh, about this, uh, I mean, uh, this remote control is the same. Um, uh, at Alvision and, and this cap also is the same. We love a lot about this at, at Alvision because uh, each time we see plastic parts, uh, we see the, the texture. The, the uh, grain. <laughs> say, ah, this is a good part. <laughs> this is a bad part. <laughs> so I tell you, what is the bad part for Alvision in the in the in our eyes? It's a glossy part. Mm. Glossy is the enemy. Okay. <laughs> fortunately, very fortunately, it's very fashionable to have matte plastic. Mm. So this is this. It's a wonderful. And for some obscure reasons, we are the only one basically on this market. Mm. So, so we, 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 we take our market shares uh, here and, and that, that's cool also to have metal things uh, with the gold and other materials because it's always the same principle that it can be reused. But interestingly, I'll come back to my image cross-correlation, okay? Mm. It's still image cross-correlation that we use exactly, it's the same function that I wrote 20 years ago that we still call. Wow. So, <laughs> It's really, really fascinating. Your your venture is just uh, amazing, and uh, I think Benjamin is, is agreeing with me. Is agreeing with oh, me. Yes, yes, it's a beautiful story. I mean, it's a mix between science, tech, chance also as well. Uh, luck. I mean, sometimes, of course, but it's part of the journey. I mean, uh, everyone has luck in life. We use it or not. That's the question. But uh, yeah, no, it's a wonderful story. And uh, and again, we see how mathematics can be used to make money. <laughs> so it's very important for every student that is listening that when they say, oh, mathematics is, is pointless and so on. No, you can make a lot of money with mathematics, clearly. So uh, we talk about uh, your technology or application evolution, uh, how you uh, work in terms of research and development and innovation internally, we work. Uh, we talk about uh, um, uh, um, your business model also. And uh, what 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 I so uh, my question was about uh, how people use you know uh, to detect if it gen is it someone in the store uh, working for a brand or is it the consumer? Can, can I just uh, you already answer it for one of your clients for what? What, what, what about the others? Yeah, I think uh, it's a very interesting question also about, uh, we, we started to wonder at some point why customers were buying our technology. Mm. 
That's, that's a very interesting question. You are successful and you ask yourself, but why are they buying this? What, what is the risk? <laughs> so, and so we try to reverse engineer why the customers were interested. And that's interesting because normally you go the way, other way around. You try to imagine a scenario why people would, would buy and you make a theory about this. And, and I quite believe uh, the other way around. You, you try to sell things and if it's successful, yeah, you sell it more and period. And you, later you can understand it may help. But the, and theory, I mean, the theory of, of marketing and why people should buy have been, uh, have been so wrong so many times that I've stopped uh, theories and uh, only try and see if it works or not. I don't try to, to explain. So, um, so the, you, the typical use case actually is not for the consumer. Okay, this mm. is why the reason was even more obscure. Uh, it's the brand themselves. Mm. And uh, what we took us many years actually to realize is that, for instance, we went to the pharma industry, and the pharma industry, big pharma, like, like several billions uh, of, of uh, Swiss francs per year, for instance. Uh, they have offices in each country and this office will receive some boxes of drugs that are suspect. Mm. The suspect may come from uh, the customs or may come from customers and then they have to decide whether it's a real suspect, a counterfeit or not. And before us, what they had to do is that they had to train uh, some experts in each of the country to look at very small details in the cartons to see if this is authentic or not. So mm. they had a big list of things to check and I have to train people when they were leaving to, to, get, to get this expertise. And exactly. this is And exactly. the same for the yeah. customer. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Please go ahead, go ahead, please, Benjamin. No, the same for the customer authorities. I mean, you, you have to train them. They have mm. catalogs of papers to explain how to look at the product and what features to look at and so on. So it's, it's yeah. It's, it's a mess. <laughs> yeah, and it's only at this point that we realized our added value, which is incredible, you know, when you think about you make a business and you discover the added value afterwards. <laughs> this is all right. I mean, full beginners, you, you cannot imagine this. But, and and the, the added value is speed. It's just yeah. speed. I mean, yeah, uh, in the other, you and don't easiness. have to train people. You give the software, yeah. people detect, and they, are, they work um, worldwide. So one thing that, that, uh, that appeared quite quickly is that when we were successful in deploying very big uh, things like 1 billion of products per year, um, the project was really focused on being successful on implementation. That was the, and only afterwards, some people in the management of the company started to say, yeah, it, it's been deployed. Okay, uh, is it useful? <laughs> and then, then came another layer that we didn't expect. It was uh, to have automatic reporting. If you have 30 offices in the world, how do you report in real time the result of the detection? But actually, if you do the detection with a machine, it's much easier mm -hmm. because we can consolidate in real time. So quickly, we were able to offer actually a, a, a world map where you see all detections in real time taking place, which is just a dream for the for the people in charge of security. So it, it came naturally. It's fascinating, fascinating. And uh, uh, maybe you can a little bit tell us about your um, your IP strategy. If it's not, uh, we, we will not, of course, talk yeah. about. Uh, secret things but how more about at the strategy level how do you handle uh patent and how do you use patent uh, do you use them defensively or or, or pro or, or maybe let's uh, more uh, uh actively uh, and, and i also maybe a question for fun have you been treated by uh patent troll u.s patent troll or something because it's, it's a, i like to ask this question often because <laughs> Uh, I like the, the legend of uh, the patent troll that are bullying a uh, legit uh, tech company. Okay, well, first I'm a bit intimidated because we have Benjamin on board with <laughs> <laughs> in the field. So since I am I'm an amateur at everything. Not sorry, not sorry. Sound good. So it's funny because today we had a, a big IP meeting all day long. Okay, we are talking only about uh, patent strategy. So I'm just get out of this meeting. To, to come here, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm hot on the patent thing, okay? Um, so we have about 
30 mm -hmm. patterns. Uh, the initial idea was really defensive patterns. There is something that we could not accept in our mind is that we invent something that works fine. We sell it. We don't tell it to anybody. So someone invents it and patent it and, yeah. <laughs> and prevents us to use what we invented. So that was a norm story, okay? yeah, yeah. particularly for prod engineers like us. Of course. <laughs> and also, as an aside, I would say that since we are invoicing royalties, okay, it's good to put uh, something. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. I mean, yeah. <laughs> And, and the, the third, but much more recent uh, motivation I must mention is the IP box. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> this is a perfect dream for companies, like <laughs> a pure dream. Okay, so you cannot imagine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The IP box basically says that you can go to decrease a little bit or, or your taxes uh, if you make most of your revenues based on royalties, which is exactly our case. What you do, yeah, no, no. you're the perfect example for the patent box, I mean. <laughs> yeah, so um, so we, we started to, to do this. Uh, yes, now we, yes, we have uh, 30 patents. Um, so defensive strategy, um, we have third party observations that we do yeah. quite a lot. Uh, so we monitor all competitors, what they are doing, uh, patents they're filing, etc. Um, we we always find new patents. Um, every year we find new patents. Oh. So and, uh, yeah. one question: uh, Does these patents come from R and D because just something pop up, or does it come from a need from a client? I mean, do you have a process which is customer centric, saying that okay, you have this problem, so let's design a solution and let's see as well if we can have a patent in this specific technological field, uh, knowing the, the IP landscape, for example? Or is it something like, OK, we develop something, and then we think about patent, patent and IP after? No, it's really customer centric. We yeah, are purely the very extremely pragmatic people. Okay, um, And inventions are only based on this. And it goes further than this. We patent um, one of the big criteria is um, our customer using it because sometimes yeah. we develop something for for a customer mm -hmm. and at the end it, it's it's not used for, for several reasons yeah, yeah. Uh, but if it's used but that's one of the big criteria to patent uh, that's not the only criteria there is one that we use more and more and maybe because modi modification of the of the rules but I'm, I'm not don't know but it's to have obvious way to prove if someone is infringing our patent. Yes, okay. yes exactly. So something that we can see. For instance, if I um, if I patent the image cross correlation that we are so proud of, <laughs> uh, it's not easy to see if someone is infringing yeah, this exactly. because yeah. <laughs> you have to look into the code. So, no, completely, completely. Yes, it's very hard to prove the infringement. Yes, yeah. indeed. And uh, no, no, it's perfectly logical. And this is beautiful because, you know, I work with several companies and bigs and smalls. And, and even in big companies, they file patents, not thinking about the customer, but just because they have found something. So, OK, let's patent it. So that makes them having a very huge portfolio of, uh, of patents. But if you look at the value of the patent regarding the business and the customer, it's, it's very low because they just file things for the beauty of filing in a way. Uh, but in your case, I mean, with a company of more than 20 years old and you have only something like 30 patents, which can seem a bit low, I would say, for a company like that. But when you think about the value of each of them, which has been designed for practical use and it's customer centric, that means that even if you have indeed only 30 in a way, it's 30 uh, very powerful and valuable patents. And this is this is perfect. I mean, you have been able to optimize in a way uh, the, the, your portfolio by filing only things that are very valuable for your company and your customer. So it's a very beautiful example of what a company should do. <laughs> and this is why you are able to, then to license it, because you, the patent has a true value for the market and the customer, so you are able to license it. A lot of companies just file patents for, again, the beauty of filings or just because everyone is doing that, so let's do that. But th therefore, they just let it lie somewhere <laughs> and they don't use it to make money. They don't monetize it at all. So thanks for this great example. <laughs> Thank you. But you know, one, one of the, the reasons we do this is that uh, for many years, we were 
close to poor, okay? So the relationship with money we have at Alvision is very, uh, we take care of every Swiss franc that we spend. Is it well spent? And, um, and so this is going to be logical. If it's useless, we are not going, I mean, we are a small company. The fact that we are, actually, we are not poor anymore <laughs> by, by <laughs> far, but we are still relying on this basic uh, uh, of taking care of every franc that we make. Yeah. Is it well spent? <laughs> And there is something else also that we have to take into account is time, more and more. Uh, is our time well spent also? Because each time you, you know, Benjamin, better yeah, than yeah. me, the inventors are always implied in, in the, at some point. And yes, our yeah. technical resources are ultra precious. And, and moreover, some of them don't like too much uh, writing patents and things like this. They prefer to code. So we, we'd better have a good, very good reason yes, to yes, patent yes. it. So. No, that's perfect. I mean, again, this is, this is great. Uh, this is um, really a good example of what a company should do. Because even now where you are making a lot of money, you are still trying to optimize things. And again, I know a lot of companies that start small and then go big and making a lot of money, they don't and then stop to optimize things because, okay, money is coming, so it's perfect and they don't, they change. Mindset is changing. And it's, it's again, a great example to keep the same, same mindset. Uh, whatever the money is, you get, you keep the same mindset and then your company is kind of fit. You see, it's uh, she, the company is IP fit in a way uh, because you just have what is important and and in when optimizing the ip portfolio and optimizing the use of money and time you are optimizing the whole company so yeah, yeah i think it, it relates uh, something uh, a bit uh, profound about uh, usefulness okay it's more metaphysic actually uh, you go to work um, you have employees doing work what is the usefulness of their work and it, it has to to have a full meaning okay and uh, if you file a, a patent which is never used which would not be useful to anyone basically your work is nonsense yes and as an individual um i mean and and each employee should uh, I mean, we are quite very smart employees actually <laughs> so they will be ultra sensitive uh you know how people are today they are yeah, yeah. interested is it, is it meaningful for me as a human yes. being does it make sense that i do this work it, it has to be uh 100% clear. So, yeah. Otherwise, they will not accept to do it, basically, or they yeah. will be frustrated, and I don't want frustrated of this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have also some questions about patent because uh, I'm not an expert, so I'd like to learn from you guys. Um, do you do, are you open to co-patenting with some of your clients who have specific needs? Uh, or no, no. You're, no, you're the owner of 100% of your patents, right? Yeah. There, there is... Uh, so. There is one principle. I have two slides that I show always to all customers <laughs> that basically say um, all inventions that we are going to do, we own the IP. Yeah, perfect. If you pay for our development, even though you pay, we still own 100% of the IP. Wow. Excellent. Okay? Yeah, well, that's perfect. I mean, this is perfect. <laughs> But you know, what, what is interesting is that normally when I show this to brand owner, they just don't care. They say, oh, okay, yeah. uh, you can. But sometimes, one or two years later, then this comes. <laughs> oh, first, uh, see all the money that we gave you, yes. and now you file a patent, we could have a share. Hey, yes. hey you saw the slides, because of yes. course the contracts are going to reflect the slides I showed before. So, uh, and then it's clean. It's very good to have this from the, this is the only boring slide. <laughs> I always push in the front of my post. Yeah, but this is a defect of the of your customer in a way. Uh, they should have someone from IP to be here as well to discuss. But again, it's a lack of IP management in, in a lot of companies. So that's good yes. for you. <laughs> because yes, what you right. do, it, yeah, no, exactly. I mean, uh, if I was in the position of one of your customers, I would be present and I would review the contract. And at one point I would say, it's not very good for us guys. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, it's good for you, and that that's brilliant. And uh, I know that a lot of companies right now are struggling with that because more and more companies are using uh, IP management managers, and and at one point they want to keep the they want to have a part at least of the IP, and uh, and even in specially specifically when you deal with a deep tech. 
dealing with a huge company, uh, the huge company tried to, to get the, the, the IP or at least a part of the IP. And it's very complicated then. And uh, so, so it's brilliant what you are able to do. And now because of your reputation, I would say, uh, it, it's even easier, I think, now than, than it was before. Well, you know, reputation, you know, uh, for most of the people we meet, we are just uh, another startup. They have to look uh, in the history <laughs> to see that we've been there for You're some everywhere. time. <laughs> uh, another another IP-related uh, question, uh, my last question about IP. So uh, do you have some, uh, did you attack some company who try to infringe your IP or have you been treated by patent troll, particularly the US ones because they're very famous? Yes. So we, we have been attacked by, uh, attacked, I don't know if it's the word, uh, but uh, by a company who asked us to pay $150,000 uh, and uh, the director told us, you know, we have 500 patents, you have like 20, 30, um, <laughs> you want to fight. <laughs> <laughs> You'd yes, better not. <laughs> it's a patent troll, yes, indeed. <laughs> so, so basically, and, and it was really unfair because we were really not infringing their patent. We have had a, our own technology. It was really a clean situation, uh, but we still paid, okay? And we paid for many years. Uh, but oh, um, so you, but you, you accepted to pay to not go to, to the courts, right? Yes, yeah. yeah. He, he explained that if we go to the court, he explained how much is going is going to cost yes, us. Indeed. I mean, yeah, this is a game in the US. I mean, patent trolls are making money because, of course, each time you go to the court, you pay a lot. So, yeah. And this was a, indeed a US company. So, uh, on the, what, what is funny in this story is that uh, the director, the CEO of this company, uh, retired um, three years ago. And I created another company uh, called Final Spark. And uh, we hired him uh, as an advisor because <laughs> <laughs> he was so good. <laughs> it's a good one. This one is a good one. Yeah. And uh, was his company a legit company doing product, or was it a patent troll? As no, no, I, no. It was not a pure patent troll. They were okay. still uh, they were doing uh, companies now. Okay. Um, but um, but they were working also with patent trolls. Uh, oh. so, so it was a, in between, I would say. Very smart. So you ha he had a legit company with patent and product, and he has a partner that was a patent troll that, that sue his competitors, right? Yeah, something like this, yes. Wow. Yeah, yeah, that's smart. I mean, yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> now, this is crazy. For, for attacking, so we, we are not really in, the, um, in this spirit of attacking people. Uh, we are... Um, First, we are more engineers uh, looking at <laughs> at us creating value and our yeah. stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> than being aggressive. Uh, what what we did, uh, though, with one company, we uh, approached them and offered to take a license. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> on our, on our uh, technology, and then they refused, and then. Uh, then they refused and we didn't mm. insist uh, more so okay no but that's the correct move i mean uh, i always look for cooperation than, than uh, competition so it's better that they take a license from you it's win-win situation in a way but of course sometimes they they, they say no um, yeah uh, i will make a, a short digression uh, but related to what we have we have talked we are talking right now i just uh, read about a company who discovered a counterfactor in china but instead of going there and trying to fire to fight them court and so on they just look at their product it, they, they saw that the product was so fantastically well made so decided to partner with the counterfactor and they, the counterfactor became their distributor yeah. <laughs> yeah. so it's also a way to to it, appease it, things yeah, it's the same story uh, with the guy who, who attacked us that, and then we are working. Uh, his name is Bruce Davis, by the way. Um, I mean, we are doing business. Uh, we have to separate, I mean, a relationship with human beings from, uh, from business, okay? Yeah. Um, so uh, it's, it's a very special split in, <laughs> to, to make in your mind, uh, but it can work out uh, quite nicely if, if you can live with this idea. If you don't take so much personal, yeah yeah, yeah, yeah exactly i mean it's business so yeah indeed but uh it's it's a fantastic listen you, you offer us today with uh 
this with this case. Uh, thank you, Fred. Um, what about uh, let's say uh, the money now? So you are you have one hundred percent. 99 put 99 bootstrap it because we let's let's uh let's think about the the first business the first and the only business angels you had you had in your in your journey so you are 99 percent bootstrap it tech company uh what is the the future in terms of finance do you, are you seeking um vc to, to grow to grow so, much faster or not? Or not? Or do you, do you, what is your challenge in terms of finance? Are, are you are you seeking to grow? What type of growth? More more type of client? Or making more margin? Um, selling more? What is your what challenge in, in terms of corporate finance? You have so many questions here. Um, <laughs> so first, the relationship with VCs. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, at the beginning we are looking for VCs, and basically they told us that we are not serious people. We had to hire a CEO. <laughs> And they told us for many years, okay? And you know, when you're starting a business, you are very unsure about yourself and you know that you are very bad and people tell you, yes, you're bad. <laughs> and you are just a technical guy and you will remain a technical guy because there are some serious people who are called CEO and you should not be one of them. Uh, this, this, is <laughs> this is hard to live with. And uh, so <laughs> one thing about VC. Um, so at that time, VC, uh, at the beginning, they were saying that, uh, that we would not succeed and uh, okay and and of course now things have changed because we are very profitable so by the way our investor um, uh, quit and he made a 10 times his initial investment so on the phone <laughs> <That's good. laughs> 10 years so, uh, and of course now we have VCs coming to us uh, uh, we get regularly uh, people who want to invest in our company or someone some people who want to buy the whole company so, yeah of course <laughs> So now we don't need the money. Of course, people come with money. So that's sure. always the same story. So, so um, now uh, about the future. First, um, I, I do care a lot about profitability. I've always been obsessed with profitability. Um, and the reason I'm obsessed with this is that I don't want um, that money is a problem. Never. Okay. And I mean, uh, the, work we, the way we work with Alvision is money is never taken into consideration when we do a project, okay? I mean, uh, we don't have budget. We don't have budget, that's it, okay? Uh, we have a customer. If the customer is going to pay uh, potentially a good royalty, uh, we are not going to, to count if we lose or make money uh, on the first year. We just try to do the best thing to get the customer and we don't count, okay? And that's a wonderful way for the technical people say, yeah. I'm just trying to do the best. Okay. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 so that's because when it's always about making sense uh, of, of, of the work. Okay. It's so not, not be constrained by money. This basically you, you have enough money not to take care of it. And this comes for profitability. Profitability also means that we don't need a lot of employees. Uh, right now we are protecting 30 billions of products per year, 30 billion. Mm -hmm. It's huge, huge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and but how many how many industries do we cover? Well, so let's say uh, pharmaceutical, uh, food and beverage, um, luxury goods, luxury yes. goods, uh, jewelry. No uh, gold. You told you told us gold. Um, what, what are us? Uh, tobacco, um, alcohol, yeah. alcohol, uh, automotive lubricants. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and other very special things. Uh, <laughs> uh, sometimes, you know, uh, you, you know the, the small uh, porches that you find in boxes uh, yeah. when, when you buy shoes, okay? Uh, th these are counterfeits uh, sometimes. Wow. Okay. Oh, and yeah. We, yeah, okay. <laughs> and and, and, and uh, at first time, we, we were laughing when the people came with this because... Uh, yeah. <laughs> and we saw the turnover of the company. This was typically not the company that we talked to, okay? Normally, minimum is 100 million uh, mm, yeah. turnover, okay? And they were too small, uh, but they were make they are making billions of this, and uh, they are really had a big problem. And we finally ended up uh, selling this, and uh, so so this is very very niche uh, yeah, market yeah, yeah. when we are very good. Uh, there are a number of niche markets when we also sell. So it's yes, it's very diversified on the big volume of products, but we don't need twenty people. And this is another thing. Um, Personally, uh, and Martin Kutter, uh, co-founder with me, is the same. We, it's okay with that we make money, uh, but uh, we should be um, relaxed. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so for instance, I have time to talk with you. And, <laughs> and uh, one of good thing to be uh, relaxed is that you're profitable enough that you are not going to hire like a hell. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I don't want to have many employees. Each mm -hmm. and in, and if we take an employee, it's a very important decision. And this employee, we want, we want this person to stay, ideally forever, with the company yeah. forever. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we are going to select the person very scrupulously. The in order to enter our vision, I tell you, it's it's really really not <laughs> easy. <laughs> but I guess one of the primary thing above all uh, intellectual properties is what is your character? Are, are you a positive person? Yeah. Because if you're positive in one way or another, we, we will work together. It will work nicely so that we keep this good ambience that we have at, uh, at Alvision. So Fantastic awesome. uh, words yeah. about the culture of Alvision. Thank you for the, for these words. It's, uh, it's, no, it's, it's again, it's part of the success. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, to have this mindset and, and these rules in a way to, to hire only very specific people when you know that you need them as well. I mean, not just for hiring people and that's it. So again, it's it's optimization in a way because yeah. everything you do is based on a need, a specific need. And uh, yeah. Yeah, because we are reluctant to manage too many people, you know, but that, that's very interesting. It's the same story actually than, uh, than marketing when we didn't, when we had to reverse engineer why people yeah. were buying our products. We had to reverse engineer why employees were happy at Alvision. Okay, <laughs> so, so it was, what are we doing good? Because uh, we have to keep on doing it, but we should know what we do. So, yeah, yeah. so it's, it's very interesting reverse engineering what, what you do good because sometimes you do good. So it's it's almost easier to reverse engineer when you go when you do bad actually. So. Yeah, yeah, but 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 you know, all of that make me think of two things. First. Darwin evolution. I mean, first you started with several products. You were not sure which one were, were, were going to work. And, and so you tried a lot of things until something worked. So it's like an evolution. I mean, if you look at the evolution, this is exactly what happens in the nature. And, and then when you say you are reluctant to manage too many people, it's again a, a, physic, a, a principle in physics to lower the, the energy level in a way. So you, you don't want to have too many things to manage, too many people. So that makes you to reduce in a, in a way your energy level to the minimum, which is what again, by nature, uh, the universe is trying to do al always. So that means that again, uh, and I use a fit, the, the word fit, not for, for nothing. Uh, again, your, your company is fit regarding all these parameters just to, to, just, uh, to have the best of the best in each field to do what you want to do with it. Yes, and uh, I think um, for, for, for the long term, I think it's good to have, uh, to take seriously quality of life. And quality of life is a number of, of worries and things that you have to, to, to care about yeah. that you should not exceed. <laughs> to, to, so, so normally we, we don't work on the, we never work actually, on, uh, basically on the weekend. Uh, yeah. We don't work at night, uh, on the evening. Uh, we never did it actually. So it was always, nah, let's, <laughs> let's do it in, in the long run. So. No, but again, I mean, if, if the employees are happy and uh, they have a good ba balance between private life and, and work that, that make them more productive and therefore you, you reach uh, better results than just stress and stress and stress and working a lot. And yeah, yeah. this is perfectly uh, logical. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it wouldn't make sense. Now, if, if you talk, Ari, you, you were asking about uh, the, 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 the future. <laughs> so, so I, I, I'm not obsessed by by growing, uh, but of course, if I had a bunch of customers that would come with yeah. a fantastic opportunities, I, I will not refuse. I <laughs> sure about this, okay? <laughs> and uh, and the, the opening of the New York office was uh, already something, and maybe we will open an office in uh, Germany. We're thinking about this. Um, I, I think one of the big challenge uh, nowadays is technical again, mm. because after oh. ten years of finally mastering the app uh, for detection yeah. on smartphones, what happens is that customers start to tell us, Fred, we would like to detect our product without app. 
<laughs> so that's that's the best of the best now. So the the idea is that um, Fred, I go on the web page of my company. Uh, automatically, this opens up the camera. I take oh, my product. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, so it's no, okay, okay. So there is an app somewhere, but it's okay. It's not on yeah, the phone, well, but yeah. 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 <laughs> well, actually, there is indeed some processing, but it's done on the server. It's not yeah, done exactly. on yeah, the yeah. smartphone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which because the reason is that people are fed up of downloading app. They don't mm -hmm. want apps anymore. So, and uh, that's a big challenge, I tell you. <laughs> we discovered this in China. China, they have a WeChat, and mm -hmm. on WeChat, yes. basically, yeah. uh, if you want to detect, uh, what we have to do is do, do server side. It's already like this. Basically, we sell only uh, server side detection in China. This is all they want. And the number of complexity this adds to the detection <laughs> <laughs> it's a yeah, pure hell. Each app has its own um, process to take pictures, I, I suppose. So it, you have to be able to adapt to a various form of, of format, quality pictures, and so on. Yes, but you also take into account connectivity. You have yeah. to to stream across the network <laughs> in real time <laughs> pictures and detecting the others the other yeah, way yeah, 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 <laughs> on the server yeah. side in real time and then send back the so yes, yes. And that's that's a hell of complexity and this ar argument uh, when you told to your client uh, but you need a connection a good uh, an internet connection wi-fi connection uh, what happens if you don't have a good connection what, what does this argument uh, resonate in them or not that's funny that you that, that you ask this because for the past 15 years I've been selling my app saying, "Hey, Mr. Customer, with my app you don't need any connection," and I was very <laughs> successful. Yes, <laughs> no. <laughs> and suddenly I get some customers saying, "I don't care about your uh, offline stuff. I want to be connected and that it detects on the website." So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. but we, yeah, yeah, but with five G, it's yeah, it's kind of a ev logical evolution. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, I mean, it's okay. We can adapt. Uh, well, I don't know if yeah, you yeah. can, but we are trained. To... <laughs> now and you will be able. I, I mean, it's okay. And there is something else also which, which came is that customer said, "Okay, Fred, uh, we can detect fake or genuine. Wonderful. Um, well, at least we can detect genuine. Detect fake is something mm -hmm. else uh, that." It's totally other story that I can also tell how we did that, but um, but I want more. I want to have an identifier which is different from each object. Yeah. But still, I still want to detect with a smartphone. I still want it to be invisible. Yeah, yeah. Please do it. So, so, and uh, and we did it actually. We released um, at the end of last year uh, for a um, Chinese uh, automotive lubricant company. Uh, so the same ideas, you know, of this uh, of these holes in the varnish, yeah. but the difference is that we print with the uh, digital inkjet head, and for each of the labels, this is put on the on the bottles. Uh, we have a different uh, pattern, and we invented and patented, by the way, <laughs> a, a, a new way to encode information in order to. Uh, to have enough code because uh, with our previous uh, encoding system, ah, yeah. we were limited to 1,000 and then we, need, yes. we needed 50 million. So, we, <laughs> so it was judo again. It's, you know, if, if, if people ask you to go from 1,000 to 2,000, you stretch a little bit other yeah. things. And you, when if people ask you 50 million, <laughs> That, then you, you <laughs> <laughs> everything's okay. That's you start from again. scratch, yes, indeed. <laughs> but at the, at the end, it works fine. And uh, so this is one direction that we are doing. And, and it happened exactly the same for the fingerprint. The fingerprint, people told us, wonderful, Fred, we can detect uh, authentic, but we want unique, unique fingerprint. That means we are going to take one picture for yeah. uh, any, or for instance, you've got a pen, yeah. 10,000 pens, 10,000 pictures, and I want to identify each of them. And there are some regulations at the EU level that are going to force actually manufacturers to have individual traceability of their products. And in luxury industry, it's just perfect for us because it's invisible. This is exactly what they are looking for. Yeah. So <laughs> we are on this right now. <laughs> yes, and I see the challenge. Yes, indeed. I, I, I will just... Um... Uh, how can I say in English? Um, I, I will just uh, jump on what you said. Uh, 
about uh, authenticity, but also traceability. Because you know, in France, we had some uh, we had some uh, scandal about butoni and so on about the traceability of foods. And some years ago, with uh, you know some other famous brand that were that had a uh, uh, horse, you know, in in, in beef um, um, meat something yes, like yes, that. I um, can can we imagine your technology also applied to uh, not not at the end to, to identify genuine versus uh, counterfeit, but just to, to follow the traceability of the product all along its journey uh, from the producer to the, to the store. Yes. Yes, uh, Ari, but um, we are not going to help a lot here because uh, you can do this with a variable QR code. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And our unique additional uh, feature is that it's invisible. Okay. And we discovered actually that there is another market than counterfeiting, a market that it did not know anything about. Mm. Uh, it's gray market, wow. parallel trade. Okay. Um, so parallel trade, uh, you have resellers in uh, China which sell authentic I don't know, Rolex, for instance, but um, they get it at a much lower price because the general price is lower. And what they do is that they resell secretly to people in Paris. Mm. <laughs> to resellers, still perfectly authentic. Yeah, yeah. So Rolex is not happy in this case because what they want is that they want to uh, to know which are these resellers reselling on the, on the wrong course. market. Okay. So what they do is that they put a unique identifier like a QR code, like the one that you wanted. And the problem is the resellers. What do they do? They remove. Yes, of course. <laughs> so. This is exactly where we are now able to sell the variable uh, crypto, the variable invisible traceability information is only for these markets, gray yeah. markets. When you have a mark, you don't know where it is, it's invisible, but it uniquely identifies each product and will enable the brand to know which is the bad reseller. Mm. Yeah. Fascinating. And uh, just a question for my own understanding. Does this product that are sold to, let's say, China, at a lower price, genuine product sold to, to China or, or Asia in general at a lower price, or do, do they really travel and come back to, to France, or, or just uh, uh, you know accountability um, um, movement? You know, just you know, no, 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 no. rich guy buy you know from the. No, from they, the they, they come back. You know, yeah, yeah, they, they come they back. Travel. and yeah. by traveling, the price is still. A good good deal for for the French uh, let's say the French reseller. Yeah, yeah. Actually, wow. you can go at Manor. Okay, uh, you yeah. can you, you you. I bought it. Okay, recently I bought it some some perfume, mm -hmm. and you open the box, you will see inside the box some mysterious parts when some carton is missing. And what happens is that the, I I learned from this from one perfume. There are people in Italy that open the boxes for um, uh, for some brands, and with the they they remove uh, with the laser uh, with the, with the blade um, yeah, yeah. the 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 the, stick, um, the marking which is typically in ultraviolet uh, ink yeah. uh, and they are different and even uh, the box are sealed are uh, sticked you know so they open they remove the glue because inside the stick there is also some marking then we move all of this traceability information they redo the box they close it they put the film on the and then sell it at Mano. Mm. Wow, Mano in Switzerland. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's, it's fascinating just to to imagine that a product sent to China, a genuine product sent to China, come back to Europe is still profitable for the guy who will resell it. Uh, you know, uh, with oh. the travel, with all the cost of the travel. Ah. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you have been frozen for some few seconds are yeah yeah it's incredible that uh despite all this travel they are able to make yeah. a profit mm -hmm. uh, and the profit must be big because uh from the um, we had some information on how much it cost to, to do all this work uh of yeah, unlabeling I mean, yes, of course, and yeah. it's quite a lot of uh, work because they put a lot of markings and uh, traceability information everywhere and the, the and the reseller in Europe take the the risk to be uh, blacklisted by the the manufacturer by doing if it's um, well the thing is that he, he, yeah you're right but uh, at least he, he cannot uh, know who was the the exactly. origin of the reselling mm -hmm. yeah. 
Wow. So the grain market is uh, also a new challenge for you uh, in the coming month, let's say. Yes. And what is it very interesting, you know, um, when you think about counterfeit a feature, okay, for years, the problem that we had, the fear that we had is that bad guys would copy our yeah. A feature. Yeah, of course. And we were nev never feared that people will remove our feature. It would never happen. Sure. Nobody is going to transform a genuine thing into a fake thing. Okay. Yeah. Now we have exactly the same opposite requirements. Okay. We put a variable information. We are afraid that bad guys remove it, but we don't care if they copy it. Yeah, That's yeah, very yeah. funny. It's the, the exact opposite set of requirements, but still the same technology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it's a, it's a, a dream come true. You can reuse the same technology on plastic, on paper, counterfeit, gray market. It's still your, you have one solution fits. <laughs> <laughs> one equations and that's it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, by the way, and of course it will be secret, but uh, I suppose that you have also trade secrets, not only patents, right? Yes, yes, you're right. And it's a very big, I mean, it's very interesting that you say, of course, it's your field, but um, it's logical that you talk about this. And we have also, we have a lot of know-how in this company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, I can imagine, it's incredible, yeah. okay? This is why yeah. also I love to keep the employees back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <of course. laughs> and uh, we yeah. have always to, um, to select what we are going to patent or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is also what I was uh, talking at the beginning. What can we prove easily? that people yes. are infringing. And may, many trade secrets are things that you cannot prove because it's yeah. hidden in the, in the process. So. No, yes, exactly. No, because, because especially in this field, I mean, when you publish, when the patent is published, of course, counterfeiters will are able to look at it, to understand the tech and to try to overcome it. So it's always a trade between, should I publish it or not, in a way. Yes, great. But I must say that we are also in a, in a situation, you know, when we started, we are basically only one in the world. Yeah. You know, life is easy. Nowadays, life is not that easy. <laughs> 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 we listed uh, the number of computers were 130. Yes, yes. Okay. So, and we are sitting in the country where the wages are the highest in the world. Yeah. So in a competitive situation, <laughs> it's not the best. <laughs> it's pure hell, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so we'd better be very, very innovative to uh, to to, uh, to to still sell, and uh, this is why yeah. we have to go to grey market, uh, still about fingerprint, gold things, uh, where people yeah. are still not uh, thinking about. But when you say competitor, you you uh, you. People, uh, uh, you are talking about a company who are offering alternative or uh, alternative solutions, but not exactly what you are doing. You are the you, you are the only one who are doing this uh, um, this this uh, mathematic based uh, image analyzing, right? Right. So, but that's <laughs> that's not enough to sell each time, you know. Yeah, um, sure. <laughs> for instance, uh, if you have someone that comes and say, "Okay, I have something. Okay, it's visible." Okay, it's visible. Okay, but it's uh, you mm. know three times uh, less expensive. Mm. Ah. Mm. So, yeah. <laughs> so things like this. There is some markets the... that could change. Yes, indeed. And in this case, do you have to 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 demonstrate him that uh, his protection can be uh, can be uh, can how can I say can be uh, um, counterfeited by counterfeiters or, or just copied by by. Or removed, um, or that, that's not very nice. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, um, we would we would more uh, try to, um, to to go the other way around. Okay, uh, at the very beginning, uh, when we get a prospect, I'm going to judge. I, I'm one of the filters of the prospect. I push back the seventy-five percent of the prospect that come to me. I push them back. Mm, okay. I don't want you as a customer. Because there is no chance we are going to make a good business together. Okay. Okay. So and so I'm going to identify whether so if the people come and say I've got one billion of products to pro, uh, to protect, I know that with what we have, because we have zero cost of production, we yeah. are going to be ultra competitive. Yes. Yes. And and this one I say okay. And so I can identify very early if it's a good case for us or not. And I have to do it because because we don't mm -hmm. have budget. 
<laughs> I'll, I'll better be shown the, about the quality of the prospect. Yeah, yeah. So again, there is an optimization in the selection of the customers. Yes, and, and this comes also for hiring people because yeah. I push back so many prospects, I'm sure that the few that enters into L Vision are going to, to be worth it. And, yeah. and normally I don't have to hire more people. And, and I'm not going to decrease my profitability. I'm going to keep it high. Yes. To the price. So basically at the end of the day, <laughs> I have only very rich uh, customer um, and very smart customer. I don't have a stupid customer. This doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, but I mean, this is again an optimization and it's part of the success. Yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating, uh, your journey is fascinating. Alvision is, uh, is an amazing company um, because each time you have a new challenge or a new type of technical problem to solve, you don't need, you know, to, to hire new, such as, you know, in the, in the IE field, you know, they are always seeking, uh, first of all, they need the data analyst, then data scientist, then, LA, then the deep the, uh, artificial intelligence. So they're always seeking new, new talent with new expertise to bring on board. But you with your staff, your stable staff, you can always challenge and manage all the problem that you, you have to solve. This is, this is a fantastic, in terms of business, it's fantastic. Yeah, also because pe people are very happy actually to solve problems and, and new problems. But there is also um, a relationship with uh, honesty. Okay, the, the way, <laughs> this is the anti-selling technique, basically. Um, what I have an obsession is not to have customer disappointed. This is, this is worst of all for, for me, yes. okay? And so anti-selling is going, uh, I'm, when I start to talk with customers, I'm going to, um, to see exactly what may fail, okay? And it's the, it's the opposite of a seller, okay? <laughs> okay. To make sure that uh, we are going to have a very good relationship in the long term. So if the guy, <laughs> despite my anti-selling, is still willing to work with us, <laughs> yeah. that means the fundamentals are good. That means if, there are, if I have some doubts about something that can be done or not, I'm going to say it right from the beginning. Yes. And some filter I have something that works quite fine. If I'm unsure, I say, Sir, I, I want to, to make a feasibility study because mm -hmm. I'm not sure. A feasibility yeah. is that it may uh, not work, but you are going to pay for it. Typically 5,000 Swiss francs. This is a perfect filter because mm -hmm. if the guy is ready to pay for this, he's really motivated. And then I, I tell you, we're not going to spend for 5,000. Mm -hmm. We're going to spend for way more because people here are going to get so excited about solving the problem. So that we're not going to count the money, but we have selected uh, the right type of person. Yes, mm. it's, a, it's a great teaching uh, for, for Andrew and this is a fantastic transition because now we have covered, I think, many, many uh, fields about our vision. Maybe if you want, do you want to add some point about our vision before we move to the conclusion? Did you, did, did I miss, did, you, did we miss some question you would, you would want us to ask you? You know, Ari, I, I, I'm sure I'm going after this interview. I'm, yeah. going to I'm going to say, "Oh, oh, it's a pity I've not talked about this or this." And uh, it's because it's always the same. Um, I hope we did not miss some some big things. Uh, I, I'm, I'm almost sure. I, I feel that we missed. Some <laughs> you know, you know how it works. If if you after the show you you, you, think of new yeah. thing, you just send me an email and we do a third round with together because. For people who doesn't know, we we already made a first round about Final Spark, a fantastic yeah. startup that you launched. Uh, but I will, I will not talk about Final Spark now. But uh, if if you have, you have something new in, in your mind, we'll do a third round, a fourth round, <coughs> fifth round. No, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's 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 always to a pleasure to talk about this company uh, and um, how it went from it, it's. It's incredible story, you know, when when you start in at, at home uh, with your printer trying to do some things which like like an amateur uh, and you don't know how to sell and and you create a website and you hope that people are going to call you <laughs> <laughs> and you, you learn about uh, making contracts. So ah, one thing, uh, two things I've learned also just uh, takeaways for people who want to avoid this kind of mistake. Um, one thing, um, we sold for many years, uh, and we still sell, uh, for, uh, in euros. Okay. So at some point we have millions, uh, of euros and they were sitting in a bank account and we don't care. And, um, 
and then the conversion rate between Swiss francs uh. and euros changed progressively years after years, and we're not, not looking at those. I, I, I'm, I've lost, I know, I know how many millions uh, in this. This is a, yeah. the highest loss I have, we ever had in our life. And uh, that's incredible because us as engineers, we were looking at detection, cross-correlation, yeah, stuff yeah. like this, okay? <laughs> Satisfying the customer. We are not imagining that we could lose money by not doing something because of co conversion. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Is, uh... <laughs> but did, did, didn't you have a, a, a CFO? No. Financial? no? We, we still don't have. Uh, we don't even don't have secretary, so. Okay, wow. <laughs> So uh, it's very, very lean, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. And, um, so, and uh, another uh, very good mistake. Um, <laughs> that so is, it, is it an advice uh, to, to, when you grow to hire a CFO or not? <laughs> we, I think we are going to do it. Uh, okay. yeah. we, we are looking for, for, for one. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, another big mistake uh, that I recommend at uh, testing uh, <laughs> is that we sold some contracts like it was like, I don't know, 300,000 Swiss francs per year uh, mm -hmm. for, uh, for the customer. Okay. And uh, it was written 300,000. Mm -hmm. okay. The problem is that we keep our customers so long that 15 ah, years later, yeah. I mean, yes. you have yes. the index, uh, Swiss index of yep. salaries, which is published yeah. on admin.ch, and you can see how many <laughs> money that we are losing. And every year we're going to, to lose more and more because of this stupid mistake that we yeah. made 15 years back. Okay. Yeah. So that means that in our contract now, we always put a clause that says we are going to create all prices each year based on admin.ch index of uh, salary. Yes. Very wow. simple. <laughs> and it works. And um, mm, that's, yeah. And then this, 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 this one it was great because. Uh, uh, it's uh you know it's uh, it's um uh, it's 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 not funny but it's uh, it's i heard it sometimes by others you know so it's a very debut debutant mistake but it's it's um it's it's always repeating well i can tell you we made so many mistakes uh, that we created a document of mistakes uh, <laughs> that that we call in french connery uh <laughs> and uh we list all the mistakes that we that made us lose some money. This is the criteria, okay? <laughs> and uh, and the document grew uh, years after years. And now each time we make a new contract, we check this document. Mm. So we can make mistake once, but not twice. So at least let's, let's have a process, okay? And we became uh, in love with processes, okay? F for everything, we have a process to make sure we don't forget. So yeah. we can relax because we know it's going to be uh, <laughs> you, you, should, you should you yeah. should publish a book based on this document yeah. with, a, with some storytelling, you know, on it. I, I, I'm pretty sure it will be a, a, a great success among entrepreneurs. But you know, about contract, there is something else that we learned. At the beginning, we were making the contracts made by lawyers, mm -hmm. okay, commercial contracts. Yeah. And then we realized it was a fantastic mistake. Fantastic. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was big, big mistakes in this contract because the contract was so big with a lot of things that we forget about the important things of the contract. And also because someone else was doing it, we were putting the responsibility a bit away from us, which yes. is total a mistake. Yeah. So at some point we totally changed. No lawyers involved in any contract that we work. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's incredible. So never, okay. We just did from scratch. Uh, we have the things, we know what is important, pricing delays, pricing delays, okay. <laughs> and, uh, and that should be clear. And uh, we are used, because of the, the, all the mistakes, we have the background of mistakes, we avoid those <laughs> ones. <laughs> and, uh, and so far, it's, it's been doing great. And these contracts are way, way uh, slimmer uh, yeah, uh, than the normal yeah. contracts. Now we, can, we cannot always do this because if you work with very big companies, they're all, the last contract we signed was 134 pages. Mm. So it was not coming from us, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> fantastic. So, okay, thank you very much, Fred. Let's uh, conclude this uh, fantastic uh, episode and maybe some talk about some more light things. Um, how do you um, see uh, the future? of counterfacting, do you think that it's a market that uh, 
that uh, because it's linked to the to the behavior of human being, you know, because human wants things that have value. So and when they can't access to something that is valuable, they or they are always criminals. But do you think that with all the technology that are spreading, uh, artificial intelligence, your technology, and many other uh, way, we will kill, you know, uh, just like some sci-fi movie uh, like Elysium, you know. Uh, uh, every human being will be traced and nobody can, can do bad yeah. things. Or... Uh, uh, yeah, I think the long-term vision, uh, particularly with the augmented reality um, uh, glasses, is that at the end of the day, we can have real-time detection of counterfeits. So yeah. you take it, you see it's red, it's fake. fake. Yeah, yeah period. Very simple. Totally uh, user-friendly. Wow. So yeah, uh, I don't know if you have, if you, if you have watched uh, the movie Elysium, you know, the, uh, uh, the uh, the human being they are separate in two classes. The upper class were living in in a kind of space uh, station around you. Yes, I, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and all the other ones are traced uh, every day, every moment at every moment of their life, so they can't move a, a finger without being recorded. And so um, maybe this is where we are going, or not. Uh, so what would be um, let's say some a couple of key advice for for a PhD or postdoc who want to move out the, the university uh, and launch their deep tech startups, what would be, what, what, what would you tell them? I think uh, it's very important to talk pe uh, with people who've made it, uh, who made some business, okay? So, um, and, and they're welcome to, to talk to me, okay? Uh, oh, I will find some time, I'm happy to do it. Uh, um, so, uh, I, because uh, there are some practical things and when we can quickly say, oh, yes, that, that looks like a mistake I did before. This is the, I, I, can, I cannot say if an ID is good, but, but I can say if I recognize something bad I have did with yeah, that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I think people should uh, always uh, try to discuss uh, with people, uh, mm -hmm. with people who, who, who made it before, okay. So who have some, uh, some proof that they've been able to create some, some money. And I yeah. talk here about, um, some people uh, try to uh, seem to confuse turnover and uh, profit, mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, I mean, profit is very different. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly, <laughs> and valorization as well. I mean, a lot yeah. of companies are. I have valorization of one million. Yes, of course, but how? What is your profitability? And sometimes it's zero. <laughs> yeah, and uh, that that that's the big step of thinking profit and being uh, very 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 pragmatic. So there are many things that. Uh, we thought we were important, like uh, having a nice business cards or the way mm -hmm. you, you dress or things like this, but that we are so wrong on many things. At the end of the day, what mattered the most is the technical performance mm -hmm. and the fit to the um, customer needs. Yeah, the value you, you bring to, to the customer, absolutely. So uh, maybe a last question for the PhD and the postdoc who would like to create their, their, their tech startups. Most of them, because Benjamin and I, you know, we talk with them a lot. And we decipher that most of them are a little bit scared of the unknown, of the outside world. You know, they are, even they are a little bit uh, bad treated in the academia. You know, the bad pay, the bad, bad. Now a lot of competition for them to to, to become a professor and have having their labs. But they prefer to stay in this bad condition because they are feared of the unknown of the outside. What what could you say to them? To, to fight and counter this, this fear and, and tell them that entrepreneurship is a fantastic, uh, or is not, maybe it's not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, it's a fantastic journey, but it's clearly not for everybody. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I would say that maybe one people are out of 100 or one out of 1,000 is a bit, the ratio that I have are, are for this, okay? Um, yeah. I mean, so you are like this. And normally you should, people should not uh, feel bad because they don't create a startup. <laughs> that would be a mistake, okay? If they feel happy to, to go in, they should be inspired that what they do. They should feel bad if they're not happy in what they are doing. Mm. Yes. Okay, so that is the mistake, okay? <laughs> Whatever you do, okay? And personally, I'm, I'm just happy. I'm happy to talk to you. Uh, I'm happy to be there. I'm happy uh, to work, uh, to go to uh, my company every day. So, so, so I know this is good. The rest <laughs> is less important. <laughs> this is a fantastic teaching. Uh, always go where you are celebrated. Yes, uh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 
but that's it. Maybe we can stay on that. I think it's the best message. So yeah, we'll stay on that. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, friend. It was a fantastic moment with you, and we were very, we were delighted to have you. Uh, uh, and you know, we can keep you day a day long and talk with you uh, <laughs> infinitely. You know that. So, but we have, we have to. I have to cut this this episode at, at the moment. So we have, we have to cut it. So thank you so much for being. Yeah, thank great. you very much. Thank you, thank you very much for your time, both of you. Uh, I, I, I knew it was a pleasure, and it was indeed a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much.